Hey, I guess they're right. Senior citizens, although slow and dangerous behind the wheel, can still serve a purpose. No, that's uh, from Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. I'm your huckleberry. I'm rich and I'm dead sexy. <laughs> we'll be starting in a second. Well, it's a well-known fact, Sonny Jim, that there's a secret society of the five wealthiest people in the world known as the Pentagrid, who run everything in the world. Well, here we are. And I'm all out of office. Live exclusively for WCPT in well, Chicago. Here we are. Standing up and speaking out, here's Hal Sparks. That is absolutely right. That is why we are here every Saturday, 9 to 11 Pacific Time, 11 to 1 Central Time, with Johnny Million joining us today. Um, for those of you joining us on the live stream at infotainmentwars.com, like it, subscribe to it, click it, thumbs up it. Uh, he's wearing his Jack Burton. Uh, Jack Butler. Uh, sorry, Jack, Jack Butler shirt. I was just doing a Jack Burton clip so they uh, see what that happened. Yeah, Jack Butler, who is uh, Steve Vai's character in Crossroads. And it's um, pretty much our Ed Sullivan on the Beatles Yeah, was Steve Vai in Crossroads. That's when everybody was like, hang on, what can you do on well, a guitar? Yeah, right, what? And then the Yankee Rose video came out, and then it was just like, and then you found out and this is one of the things that tears at the reality of your existence, that Steve I played both guitar parts in the guitar duel at the end of the it's movie. the best. And so I've never been happier to see a man play with him. This is not wrong conversation to have. So um, <laughs> by himself um, is the phrase I'm looking for. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, hi, chat room. They're all saying hi, Johnny. Uh, he'll I be see. joining in with you in a moment. Um, lots of news to get to. I feel like uh, I feel like Rachel Maddow right now. Like mm -hmm. lots of stuff. Thank you for joining us for this hour. Lots to get to. Um, we had a whole different show planned. We had a whole different yeah. We had everything, and then all of a That's sudden, always what happens. Yeah, then all of a sudden, Russia. Yeah, this side note of stuff comes out. We have had um, over the course of this show, you know, like the the vacillation in news stories is extraordinary. Just the it, it's it's like watching the EKG of someone who's being electrocuted, just at ping ponging from story to story. And in in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and understanding that as national crises go, this is pretty much top of the line. This is this this is all you need. You know, you're you you get something like COVID rolling into your country, your dance card is full. You're good to go. Yeah, I don't need any other scandals. I you know what I mean? I I don't I'm we don't fine. Yeah. we don't need civil unrest in the streets due to a man being murdered uh by police. We we don't I didn't need it. Nobody needs it. No. Nobody was waiting for this going, you know, checking their watch. Nobody was Exactly. All those jokes that I even piled on about, like, oh, what's going to happen in June? A volcano and uh, like, volcano, oh, how's yeah, Yellowstone doing? Yeah, first oh, murder hornets and then this, and I'm like, oh my god, and, yeah, and so civil unrest, <laughs> right? And all of these things kind of point to the interesting thing is all of these scandals are one scandal for the most part. Both the civil unrest aspects and the protests and the and the rioting and looting that went along with it, and COVID nineteen, um, and the economic crash that we're all experiencing, all are actually one scandal. And the scandal is that the president of the United States, the current occupant of the Oval Office, made a point of coming into office and eliminating anything he saw as a success by his predecessor yeah. and anything he couldn't get rid of or that was popular taking credit for. This is, yeah, I mean, he's that, pretty good at it too. Yeah. And all of it's his only skill. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy who was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. He um, is in the, he and his family are in the process of suing a niece for writing a book that has too much truth in it, but not enough classified information to get a real injunction. The judge pushed back against that today, or yesterday. 
Uh, so he's trying to stop the Bolton book and his niece's book? Yeah, and Mary Trump's book at the same time. Under the idea that Mary Trump, uh, niece to uh, Fred Jr., the, the older brother who died of, of, of allegedly of alcoholism, he died of a heart attack. They believe it was related to his drinking. Oh, sure. That's been the constant refrain. At this point, with the number of people that Putin is snuffing to get his things done, I'm not taking anything for granted. I'm not getting into the conspiracy world, but I'm not automatically buying a, a family's version of medical events, <laughs> especially when it's that family. And Mary Trump has written a book. It's coming out in August. They have filed an injunction, failed this week. There's another one being put forward to try and get her to not be able to get publish her. a book, which is about the the monster of Donald Trump that was created by the dysfunction of their family. She has a degree in psychology. She co-wrote a book on schizophrenia. She's She literally has, in life, chosen a path like a lot of people do. Thank you, uh, Hal Vickery and and uh, Paul Bellage and Lipschitz for the, uh, the support right out of the gate this morning. So there has been, in this family, uh, it's no surprise that there's tons of dysfunction. Yeah. Um, you know, her uh, Trump's own mother is basically somehow qu quoted as saying she knows she's raising a monster. Um, we we now will find out at least from what's being. Where does that out, quote come from? From her. But um, like, where, where did it get unearthed? I mean, yeah. we all knew she raised a monster. I yes, uh, I don't. I'll have to look it up, but um, <laughs> because there's just simply too many. Yeah. This this story about how Trump doesn't drink because of his brother's alcoholism, which totally cuts against you know anything that uh, Noel Castor says ab about Trump's alleged drug use on the set of uh, The Apprentice and at the parties afterwards. I think he does everything but drink. <laughs> I think he's a dry drunk who loves uppers. Right. Yeah, that seems to be the case. It seems to be a, it's a speed thing. You know. It's, yeah. Um, you know, and if he was a robber baron, he'd be a gin drunk in the 30s, you know, because all those guys drank gin with the thought that it helps you be better at math. But, um, yeah. Uh, you got to work in some sniffs. Yeah, exactly. And that weird bump on the side of his nose that everybody points out all the time, myself included. But the point is, Mary Trump is writing this book about her uncle, basically going, he's awful. I've been around him my whole life. Their, the family not only sued her and her brother <clears throat> to get for them to get less of the inheritance because their dad died. So I mean, obviously, what they he doesn't get his share, so they don't get his they don't get their dad's share of the inheritance because he died. So they they get less. Also, mm -hmm. Trump apparently argues that his nephew, her brother, shouldn't they that the. There should be no money in the inheritance that goes towards his health care because he has cerebral palsy. Mm. Like, you know, the lovely interactions of a family you would want in charge of everything meaningful. And we have <clears throat> we've had this thing about, you know, uh, Trump's footsie with both the Russians and the Chinese and it being related to money that he allegedly owes them. In some cases, absolutely owes them other uh, other funds. I have not found the lockdown final article on this. Is the here's the ledger, um, but in a lot of cases, there there's a bunch of stuff that you know is is rather overt. Even in spite of the fact that Trump uh, and his family try to hide where that money came from and where it went, yeah. you have Don Jr. and Eric on television saying the bulk of our investments come from Russia now Russia. at really awkward Oops. moments, right? So, again, and this points to a specific thing, which is because Donald Trump was born on third base thinking he hit a triple, he has been a second-generation rich kid in, a, uh, in the Manhattan real estate bubble, and I mean that as a dome, not as something that's going to pop in the traditional investment scheme concept, although... I, I think it's time we start pulling that thread. I think American yeah. real estate needs to be the next big investment front in the in the war on foreign influence in the country. It would make a huge difference. Um, and it would also uh, affect the amount of money from these real estate groups that gets to be piped into politics in our country in certain areas. And uh, anyways, so 
one of the areas he, you know, he gets so behind in business. He's he's obviously lost a uh, casino. He's you know he's banked up bankrupt a casino. Uh, the brand has taken a dive over the last few years, even before he became the most unpopular president in the modern era. A thing which he could have prepared for, knowing that it's a contentious office, knowing that they would have had to shore up and separate the name, the family name and the family business from the man as a president, that kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. what intelligent people do. But it's the lack of preparation and the idea that it's always someone else's fault that is at the primary root of all of these issues. Yep. His relationship with Russia and why he needed loans from them in the first place. His uh, issue with scuttling the pandemic response team and then being yeah, behind just the a blame game with everything else. That's right. Having, you know, the cupboards were bare and rec and without understanding the irony that he's been president for three and a half years. And if you discovered something was bare when you got an office that you thought would be necessary and you knew was going to be a pandemic and it was something you you would have been prepared for, blaming something that happened that you've been in charge of for three and a half years is is something that would get a CEO dis, sum, summarily dismissed with a security guard in the at the opening knock of the uh, yeah. of the board of directors meeting done. And if COVID if COVID is just you know it's only as bad as a flu, then, then what does it matter how many ventilators that we have? Right. You know. Yeah. 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 And we're just selling them to other countries, just like we're building defense stuff. We, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's all it is. Like it's it to him, America's a business, and he's having a hard time recognizing that you can't fire the poor. You can't <laughs> fire people. <laughs> you can't fire citizens. Well, they really need to step up their game right, if they want to keep their job. We got, we got to take a break. When we come back, I want to address in today's show all four of those areas and how they all have the primary problem of Donald Trump being lazy and entitled and essentially ignoring every possible threat in the future that we might see. So this, I'm just saying this doesn't bode well for a second term if you're playing footsie with the idea that this is the guy, because if you think the next four years aren't gonna have any crises in them, then by all means, he's your skate candidate. But in yeah. the last couple of months or any indication, um, th and, and we'll leave Yellowstone out of this for the time being. I mean, I don't even recognize those states. That, that park got me coffee. I don't know why we weren't drilling it for years. We'll be back right after this. Johnny Million, so super talented. Yeah, he's just a super talented mama. We win. That's what that song says. That's right. We are, uh, we're live. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you. Welcome. Hello, Twitter. Hello, uh, everything but Facebook. Hello, um, oh, it's, geez, how can they all be on? That's weird. Turn that one off. What are they? Why is that on? Okay. Um, I have multiple destinations. My, feed can go to. Mm -hmm. And um, allegedly, <laughs> I'm supposed to be able to do four. And I have six in total, but I don't turn them all on at once, right? And somehow they all, I think I clicked the all on button and they were all... It was Where'd all your cat go? What do you mean where'd my chat go? Your cat, your kitty cat. Oh, the kittens? Oh, well, well, someone was howling at the door. Oh, that was Murphy. Yeah, Murphy's, he's downstairs by the closet. I think we, Summer let him in the closet. He, he, he's, <laughs> poor Murphy. Poor little So fella. many cats. My, my cat will just go insane right. until you let her into the closet. And then she just sniffs at it and turns around and walks out. Oh, that's him with water. If you turn on the, if you turn on the faucet, uh -huh. that's his big thing. Is that he's, uh, let me see. Am I over? Yeah, okay. Um, he, he needs water. He drinks out of the faucet. He loves it. Um, but if you, and he's like, he'll sit there and meow till you turn it on. And then he hops up and just, ah, you know what? I got gotcha. you. Everyone. Gotcha. Thank you. Gotcha. <clears throat> if I didn't see if you would do it. Oh, and we do. Um,
Let's see. All right. Bless you. Thank you. Hold on one second. I gotta, I gotta close the. Well, the green screen looks crazy when you walk away from it. Yeah. Why does it just started going like? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, it gets it. It's just... it gets real wobbly. Oh, that's because you're watching the, um, the internal Skype one or whatever. Yeah. So don't don't whatever me and Skype. I'll whatever you. You're very important. This is Doris well, Davenport, uh, host of the Doris Davenport Show, all local, all the time. Now let's get back to Hal Sparks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide. Okay, so um, before we get into all the areas where Donald Trump has ignored every possible danger and threat to the country until it's an absolute crisis, and then basically said, it's the governor's fault, really. We're not in the business of, this is not our thing. It's not, you know, can you imagine the 9-11 response? Oh, uh, my uh, God. I, oh, for, it's, it's absurd, right? So yeah. before we get into that, um, I would like to... Um, there's one thing that's been particularly galling to me, and it keeps coming up, and I, it, it's incredibly frustrating, and I don't know how it keeps slipping through. The, Trump, has, Trump makes a lot of statements. He, he lies a lot. It, it is a, you know, it is a... a a modern fact checker, uh, checker's dream to go through everything that he says. Yep. But there is one in particular that aggravates me more than anything that he's been saying lately. And that is the constant and never ending thing that we got VA choice passed and everybody had been trying to do it for 45, 50 years. He, he exaggerated whatever the last number he says, he adds five to it. Um, and everybody had tried to get it passed and we couldn't get, and we were the ones who got it passed. I gave you VA choice. This is, and what does VA choice mean when he says it? That if you can't, uh, see a VA doctor, you can go see a private doctor. We pay the bill, right? This is, we've heard this so many times from him that VA choice, we got VA choice done. Nobody could get it. Done. Oh, sorry. The one moment. I was getting a little audio chop, but hopefully it's better. Um, mm -hmm. That has been more than any other aspect of his lies and kind of. I mean, beyond like like birther sounds quaint by comparison, and this is all tied together. Uh, by the way, this is a this is a situation where. Um, let's see. Do I? Do you sound all right? Say hello, Johnny. Let me make sure my audio. Hello, goes. Johnny. Okay, yeah. You're One, good. two, three, four. I think so. I think so. It's good. Okay. So, um, the the lie about VA choice is one of the most consistent. It's it's to, it's of the multiple accomplishments he lists as his own. It is probably the one that rings the strongest with voters. I would say, like, if you heard that everybody had tried to pass VA choice. And the veterans had a bet were able to go see a doctor, a private doctor, and and it was Donald Trump that finally got that through. Mm -hmm. If it if that was sounds the thing, great, you know, you'd be you know everything about it says that you would you you would go okay. Well, as much as I hate him, as much as I don't like what he did, I mean, I believe in our veterans and they deserve better. And this is something he can point to. You go, well, okay, yeah, that was one of them. Like promises kept, yep. whatever. Okay. Except for the fact that the VA Choice Act, uh, otherwise known as HR 3230, was passed and signed into law in 2014 by Barack Obama. Now, one of the reasons... Like, I know uh, more than I need to know about bills. <laughs> uh, many people know that the reason I ended up on Stephanie Miller's show in the first place was because I read the Affordable Care Act all the way through. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I read it because people were going, no one has read this. No I'm one's like, read this bill. Okay, I'll read it. 
So if everybody, and whenever somebody goes, no one ever read, you go, well, Hal Sparks did. That forever in history. So cover to cover, baby. And I'll do the same thing to the full Mueller report once the, I get a full unredacted version. I've read the other version. I'll read every version they put out, I'll, you know, once they addend, uh, you know, add the addendum. But what, I, I know about this one for more prurient personal reasons. Um, the original sponsor of VA Choice was a, a Kentucky representative. And I'm originally from Kentucky. I grew up in Chicago. Chicago's home to me. But I lived there. I lived in Kentucky until I was 14. I'm a Kentucky colonel. I, um, my dad worked for the state as an architect. My mom's a nurse. They, you know, we lived in Frankfurt in the capital where Mitch McConnell's been all of his life, you know, his adult life, when he isn't in, in China working on deals for ships with odd cargoes. Um, and so this was a Kentucky representative who had put the VA Choice Act through, had, had presented it, uh, sponsored it initially. It was introduced in October of 2013. It passed in 2014 and Obama signed it. The representative's name is Hal Rogers. He's another Hal from Kentucky who cares about veterans. And even though he's on the other side, this is a dude who went, we need to take care of this. And it became a public law August 7th, 2014. And what it does is it allows veterans, if they cannot get a... Uh, a, see a doctor at, in 30 days, if they make an appointment and it's longer than 30 days to see someone, they can go to a private doctor and the, uh, the, you know, the taxpayer pays the bill no matter who the doctor is. Or private doctor, yeah. a doctor <laughs> for money. Do what they tell me to do. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't we a pair raggedy man? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> different movie setup. Anyways. So, in that bill, 30 days, if you can't get an appointment, 30 days out, most of the window was below that. So that was, in, that was for extreme situations, but it was set up there. If you can't get one in 30 days for, you know, for elective stuff, like regular appointments, this was not if you needed uh, emergency room care or if you, need, if you had something, you know, that was egregious. The idea was you could set up an appointment for your regular VA appointment. You, had, if you couldn't get it within 30 days of asking it. You could go to a private doctor. Most of the and with the idea that they would decrease the amount of time that it took for vets to see people, that would be part of the other improvements. So it was in correspondence with other stuff. Or if it was 45 miles to drive, if you had to drive 45 miles, you could see a doctor closer to you. The VA was more than 45 miles away. You could see a, a, a private doctor so you didn't have to drive that far. Um, the changes that the, uh, that the Trump administration made to the VA choice bill was an addendum put forward in the Congress. Um, I don't have in front of me who made the addendum, you know, because it came out of committee. It was multiple people on the Veterans Affairs Committee. So it was mix of Democrats and Republicans hashing out details, but they lowered the 30 days to 20 days except in um, elective stuff, which is, tw is they lowered it by two days, 28 days. Instead of having to wait in 30 days, yet you, uh, you, if you had to wait 28 days, you, could, you, know, you got an extra two-day window. And if it was 30 miles, you had to drive instead of 45. Largely because of people who were in places like Dallas or Los Angeles or places where the miles are less of a concern than the amount of time in traffic. So... You know, 30, 30 miles in Kentucky is not 30 miles in from the north side of Chicago, you know, or the south side of Chicago or to the west. Like, it, that could be hours. So the idea mm -hmm. was, hey, let's shorten the miles on it. Um, you can't do time because what does that even mean? So the, the time is a construct and a flat circle. That's right. Lunch is, lunch is an illusion. Um <laughs> Was it, uh, time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. We got, we got to take a break. But House Bill 3230 was the VA Choice Act. It was passed in 2014, signed into law by Barack Obama. 
there was a mild modification made to it in committee that Donald Trump signed into law based on investigative stuff that they did around the bill. They set the bill and they went, hey, we're also going to look into how we can make this better. Are there changes we can make? As you do with all bills, especially ones that deal with veterans' health. Um, also, the ability for vets to get same-day mental health care because of the suicide rate, which also Donald Trump has been touting as one of his accomplishments, was signed into law in 2016, was put uh, put out in force by the Obama administration, and, be and, and became active at the end of the year, before Trump took office. So nothing about his VA choice assertion is true, that they've been trying to do it for 45, 50 years. Nobody could get it done. I finally got it done. And, and not even, it wasn't even like, we need to make this better for our vets. It came out of committee that way, and he signed it, like any president would have. There is not a single Oval Office, uh, like, from, I, I'm trying to think of anybody in the modern presidency Eisenhower, Truman, anybody back then. There's not a single person I can think of in the presidency that would not have signed off on these mild modifications. What is he going to do? Veto that stuff? Are you mm -hmm. drunk? It's insane. So the president did not get VA choice passed. That's a lie. It's an egregious and disgusting lie. And it was an accomplishment of and a response by a Kentucky Republican with the first name Hal, who who worked with Democrats and got a bill signed by the by our first black president in 2014 to help veterans, not Donald John Trump. It's a lie. He keeps saying the lie, and nobody calls him on it. I'm calling him on it. We'll be back. I'm kidding. Drinking water with goji berries and lemon in it. Very good. Goji berries. Mm -hmm. This part, he says this lie every time. He was in the in that Hannity nonsense. Let me see if I can find that again. Because, like... Might be worth it. Jesus. It's so aggravating. Hey, Richard. Missed you, too. Welcome back. Hope all's well. Hope the daughters are healthy. Um, oh, there's a kitty. There's a boo. There's a kitty. There's a kitty, kitty. Um, I uh, I got a lot of sun on my cheeks, and so I've got I got Trump eyeballs right now. It's so funny. Except it's natural. It's an actual. It's actually the color of my skin. Both of them. Uh, both yeah, of your skins, both of my skins. The yeah, the one in my lizard skin and the in, the one I wear in public, so I can fit in. Put on mm -hmm. the fucking glasses, right? Um, let's see, Trump Hannity and Trump Hannity Town Hall. Uh, I'll find it. This is the one where he said uh, he's he's going to be your president. Apparently, some people don't love me. Do you love me? You want to go to a, you want to go to a club where people wee on each other? Do you love me? I'm old Greg. You want to drink Bailey's from a shoe? <laughs> oh, God, I forgot about to General old Greg. Flynn, who's a nice man, tough guy. Tough shows guy. by doing that. In all fairness, it shows a very, very low mortality rate. Just about the low. Oh uh, yeah. And just about. Who is a lowest. disaster? How that's not declared a mistrial or more than a. Mis I love this more Thank than you. a. Thank you. Es un honor. Señor President. It's an honor, Mr. President. Presidente. My Cuban background. Good. 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 Like it. Words, not English. Okay. <laughs> I have a question for you. I appreciate so much what you have done for this country. Hey, Hal. Yes. Uh, so I got Scott Duffy. He's supposed to be a guest at 1130, but he knows that you're kind of on a roll. He wants to know if you want to do it later today or right now when it's supposed to be or... Um, hold on one second. Uh, let's, uh, I thought I, my bad. I thought that was at the top of the next hour. So, um, okay. I'm just telling them I'll call him back at 12 then. 
Yeah, yeah. T- have it be at the top of the hour. Sorry about that. I I don't know why I, I thought that was. Forty-five early seconds, yet. by the way, guys. Huh? Say again. Forty-five oh, seconds. Forty okay. seconds. Thank you. Forty seconds. Are you absolutely have to play as much of that as you can? That was amazing. Um, I need to hear more of the, the Cuban El pre- question. Presidente. Yes. This is yeah. This is what do you think is the best thing you did? All of which. Oh yeah. No, we Jen Becky, we have not gotten into the Russian Afghan bounty stuff. I'm leading up to that. So aggravating. Um This is Damien Perdue of Think Theory Radio, Saturdays at 6 p.m. You're listening to Hal Sparks' radio program, Mega Worldwide. That's right. So, um, the uh, there's so much to get uh, aggravated about Donald Trump about, and yet there are still his supporters who think that he's got a list of accomplishments that is just unprecedented, unprecedented perhaps. Um, this is from Fox News' uh, town hall that Hannity gave him, which was, talk about softballs in every direction. Everybody who asked a question had been pre-screened. It was a tip-up for all the storylines that they want him to be able to talk about. They did everything they could to corral him into sounding like he was saying something it, even something. marginally reasonable in answer. And by the way, yesterday on my live stream... I went through this whole thing. So if you want to go look at it, go to infotainmentwars.com and watch yesterday's episode. I go through, at the end of the show, the entire Hannity town hall, line by line, as it happens. And in in doing this, it, all these questions, there's a point where Hannity is literally trying to help him not sound like an imbecile. And rec- That's my favorite. And, yes, and recognizing that he is failing miserably. This is and this is one of the questions he gets. This is one of the softballs. This is as a president, your easiest question. For being here with us today, say hello to President Wausau Trump. Wausau Windows, right? Windows. Yes. You know, I bought a lot of Wausau Windows. She works for Wausau Windows, by the way. Over the years, <laughs> and you know, it's uh, I shouldn't give them a free commercial, but they did a good job. It's a great window. Is it it's so good? The glass you can almost see completely through it. Our Wisconsin. <laughs> Love it up here. Thank you. Es un honor, señor presidente. My Cuban background. Good. Good, good. That was good. Good. What does that mean? I have a question. She said it's an honor, Mr. President. Good. Question for you. I appreciate so much what you have done for this country. And I know it's been tough. What do you think is your greatest accomplishment in your eyes? So a lot of people think it's the fact that we will have, I think before I'm finished this term, we'll have close to 300 judges, federal judges. A lot of people think, because that's a, a record, that's a number. It's a record. I'm in the Guinness Book for the number of, like, psychopaths. Number of judges he appointed? Yeah, 300 judges. All of them, by the way, uh, off, a, off lists provided to him by the Heritage Foundation and ALEC and all these groups. None of them Just are monsters. Like, it, it, like literally when you're listing your compliments because you're checking off boxes from right wing groups that you like, OK, throw them in there. I don't care. And the uh, the idea, too, that you're the dude who went through and found I've approved 300 judges. I looked at all 300 of these people. We worked really hard. I looked for people. He's he's nominated more people who have never, ever been a judge or a prosecutor or a defender to areas like he's offered up more unaccomplished non-legal professionals into, into judgeships than any president in history just to control the narrative with the idea that the stupid voter is eventually going to ask for something and the only thing we're going to have to push back against it is to, is, you know, is some sort of, you know, judicial wall that we put up. That nobody can even believe. And part of it was that President Obama was unable to get judges approved. In Gee, wonder why that was. A large number, about 142 judges. So I took it off, got them approved, and then got a lot approved beyond. So we'll be close to 300. And t- I took it off, got them approved. So there was, for some reason, 
Obama couldn't get judges through. I, we have to get Merrick Garland on here to answer that question. What was it? Supreme Court judges, great ones. And uh, two of them, uh, and one of them sided with the minority this week, along with the other conservatives against him in both cases they put forward. And they, denied, and they denied the two first, uh, Second Amendment uh, cases that came before them. They just said, yeah, we're not even going to look at that stuff. So I think a lot of people would say that. I think one of them, though, is our military. We have Space Force, which we've added after 70. <laughs> yeah, that's what did it. Guns in space. I, could, I was going to put pigs in space, but this is the next best thing. I want guns, you know, Space Force. We got Space Force done. No one was asking for Space Force. Most people who give a crap about space wanted more funding for NASA, wanted more of an investment and a future for NASA, a distinct, you know, 20 to 30 year plan for space exploration and all these other things. Like, that's what you wanted. He's like, how do we get tanks in space? That's what I'm looking for. I want space tanks. The six years, we've added a new branch of the military. It's a big deal, a very important deal, because space is going to be very important. It, or it's, it's, it is very important, you know, because if something doesn't spark joy, you're going to want to get rid of it. You, you need this space. <laughs> it is. I would say the rebuilding of the military and the taking care of our vets. Here it comes. So this is the one I was talking about. This is how it always comes out. He has repeated this. Multiple we had times. a 91% Sean approval rating the other day. The VA, the VA was a disaster. All of my life, I've seen these horror stories. I don't want to. I don't want to really jinx it because it's interesting because he's seen these horror stories, but he wasn't there in office when those horror stories were being confronted and fixed. Go around find somebody that's unhappy, but you don't see that anymore. And our administrator, no. our secretary, has done a fantastic job implementing a law that uh, he, did, he didn't have anything to do with. We're 91% approval rating with the VA, and we got Veterans Choice approved and Veterans yeah. Accountability. That's where you... No. No. That, I mean, that is a flat-out lie. Now, I, he says this so often and so blatantly and seems kind of impressed by it, so much so that I'm, I partly think this is beyond lie, this is actually his staff trying to get him to sign stuff that's normal by telling him he's the first. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is it. They're just trying to talk him into, you know. It makes pretty good sense. You should sign this. No one's ever been able to sign this before. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one has ever signed the piece of paper that's right in front of you right now. Nobody? Yeah, they've been trying to sign that piece of paper for 50 years since the tree was cut down in 19... 68. Fire people that do a bad job, you couldn't do it before. Very hard to get. They tried to get it for 50 years because of civil service unions, etc. You couldn't, you know, get it. I got it. And the other thing is veterans choice where if they can't see a doctor, we have great doctors in the VA, but if you can't see a doctor, you go out and you get a private doctor. We pay the bill and it's you have no idea how great it's been. And it's actually. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, it's been great since 2014. You save money, believe it or not. You have, no idea. you have no idea. We save lives, tremendous number of lives. And I would say that's an achievement. But, you know, we've done a lot with the largest tax cuts ever, the largest... Uh-huh. And, by the way, uh, not the largest tax cuts uh, ever. Um, and the regulations ones, I don't know why we're all supposed to be impressed by that one, because largely it has to do with allowing chemical companies to use chemicals that everyone knows causes cancer. Look, if you look at our regulation cut, Sean, more than any other administration in history, whether it's eight years or in one case more than that, we cut regulations and we have... He, he thinks, I guess, that Roosevelt, because he was in there more years, wasn't, it didn't cut as many regulations. Yeah, it doesn't count. We were still establishing what regulations were at that point. You know what I mean? Like, there's there's a lot of reasons why you broom out regulations, you replace them with modernized ones. It, you know, as as you look at COVID and how people learned about the treatments for it, stuff switches over time. You know, you learn things about metallurgy. Uh, you know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, and and at some point, he seems to think like. Well, we'll talk about the ships in a minute because he's at a shipyard. We still have 
A lot more we're going to be cutting over the next month and a half, two months. So we've done a lot, and we're very proud of it. And uh, we had the best, uh, you know, until this artificial problem, because I call it an artificial problem. It's not an artificial oh, which problem. Which one? He means COVID. Um, for the record, that's artificial. Yeah, no. Well, uh, if he's if this is his way of saying it was a bio weapon that the Chinese are using on us, that's a nice ex- escalation. But what I think he, he means is that it was an outside acting thing. It didn't. It wasn't part of the economy that made the economy crash. And my response would be that your economy is your economy plus life. You don't. It doesn't operate in a vacuum. You can't like look at the economy and go, our economy is fine except for the hurricane that wiped out our power grid and and all the stores and our supply chains. No, your economy involves that. And if your economy is not designed to be resilient in the face of those things, then it's a failure of your economy, not the natural yep. act. I saw this headline. We got to take a break, but I, I saw this headline yesterday about this specific area of the coast, and it said... This particular coast has taken, you know, 20 young lives over the last five years. And I went, no, it hasn't. It didn't get up from the edge of the sea and land and roam across the city, smashing people with water and stone. People died there. The, 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 the movable part are the people going to that place that is dangerous. The coast was not did not kill those people those people died trying to surf or swim in that particular area where they've been warned not to surf or swim this is not an artificial interjection into our economy this is how our economy in its current form responds to this situation and in many ways it's it's a, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do Governments all over the world, including our own, are shoring up the economy during a temporary collapse caused by an outside force. This is our economy. This is how mm-hmm. it's supposed to work. But the idea that this this was artificial, this was secondary. No, all of this stuff is part of life. You're, you're, yeah. All right, we got to take a break. We'll be back right after this. Yeah. So um, Scott Duff is going to be on at the top of the hour. He's from out Chicago. So he's going to be our guest for oh, okay, Pride cool. Month. Um, and I uh, usually I have the guests come on at the top of the uh, second right. hour. So I don't know that word got to him. So hopefully he's good um, and he'll, he should be he with is. us. Okay, good. Excellent. Sorry. I always, and I, I, I thought I kind of cleared this with Matt or anybody whenever they book somebody that it's the top of the second hour because that gives me time to use the last segment now to intro them unless it's, you know, we're trying to get it out of the way or something, which I don't think is the case here, obviously. Right. Um, but, um, yeah. Anyways, hi, everybody. A little inside baseball for those that are watching the show. Welcome. Good to see you. Johnny Millions here with us. Uh, the lovely and talented Johnny Million. Um, and... Like and subscribe to the show. Share it out with your friends. Right now is a good time to take the show and the little, little, there's like a little share button. It's over here, I think. And you can share it on your social media, your Facebook page, your, your own, uh, Twitter page, your, you know, you can take a screenshot and put the link on Instagram. I'm just saying all of these are options. So many options. So many options. So many. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll have we'll have Scott on in in just a minute um, after this next segment. I gotta find. We go. Yes. You got sixty seconds, Hal, and also two callers. Okay, great. You Fox and Friends people that are great, great group in the morning, including the weekends. To be honest with Pete, but but you have some great people. Thank you, Richard. Wow, appreciate it. But they got Pulitzer Prizes on Russia, 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 and they were wrong. He's still hammering this. Russia, Russia, Russia. The dude. Last night in our cap. Oh, let's see if I can find the. What have you got? What's your next? 
We can now project Donald J. This is, oh. this is them f fantasizing about, you know, well, what, what's your second term? This is what you put up. Oh, yeah. this is amazing. Now let's get back with Hell Sparks radio program, Mega Worldwide. So the, the town hall that Trump did on Fox News um, at, near a helicopter pad w with like planes taking off in the background, which sound like a tea kettle on television, just going, Shh, you know, and he's like, that's a beautiful sound. Like, yeah, I, I would love a cup of tea. Uh, Hannity tries to softball. By the way, it was an hour long uh, town hall with people and questions that Fox magically cut down to 43 minutes. Interesting. Even minus the commercials. Interesting. So at the tail end, Sean Hannity tries to give Trump a, you know, a little tap up. Like, here you go. This make the case. You're running for re-election. You ran as an outsider last time. You've been in charge of stuff. The cupboards were bare for three and a half years. That's indicative of your leadership at this point. What yeah. what's your sales pitch to the American people for why you're you, they need to elect you? If you hear, Thank, thanks very much. I think I did a great job. In 131 days from now, at some point in the night or early morning, we can now project Donald J. Trump has been reelected the 45th president of the United States. Let's talk. How do? What's at stake in this election as you compare and contrast? And what is what are your top priority items for a second term? Well, one. What is your top priorities for uh, items for a second term? Top, what, what, yeah, compare okay. Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast. It, what's what's at stake? So obviously, if Biden gets in, what's going to happen? If you get in, what's going to happen? Tell us what you're going to do with four more years. This is it. Kill it. Knock it out of the park. Go for it. The things that will be really great. You know, the word experience is still good. I always say talent is more important than experience. I've always said that. But the word experience is a very important word. It's in a very important meaning. I never did this before. I never slept over in Washington. I was in Washington, I think, 17 times. All of a sudden, I'm president of the United States. You know the story. I'm riding down Pennsylvania Avenue with our first lady, and I say, this is great. But I didn't. It's, it's a cool story, bro. <laughs> it's just, you know, Seriously. like I said, the, the, the grasp of the English language and the ability to just pull you into the narrative and paints, mm. he paints pictures with words, Johnny. He paints, I'm sitting there with the, f the first lady going, this is great. You know the story. You know the story, it's great. No, very many people in Washington, it wasn't my thing. I was from Manhattan, from New York. Now I know I, Whichever one. Everybody. And I have great people in the administration. You make some mm. mistakes, like, you know, an idiot like Bolton, all he wanted to do is drop bombs on everybody. You don't have to drop bombs on everybody. You don't have to kill people. Sometimes if John, you if John Bolton and Okay, at the tail end of that, listen, everybody, listen to this. He's like, you get, again, we're, he's supposed to be comparing and contrasting what he is going to do in his second term and what's at stake. What, it, what happens if Biden gets in? What happens if you get in? What are your priorities? That's what he's saying. Yep. And what he goes to is sometimes you hire an idiot like Bolton who wants to drop bombs on everybody. You can't drop bombs on everybody. Listen to the tail end. He's starting to say, sometimes you have to drop bombs on people. Uh -huh. like, like this, it's this, it, Trump has his own version of both siderism. He likes to ride both sides, of, you know, he likes to face both sides of the horse while he's riding. Bombs on everybody, you have to kill people. Sometimes if John, you if John Bolton. And sometimes you may. <laughs> like, and, then he goes, if, and then Hannity interrupts him. If John Bolton what? Back, release classified material. Should he be prosecuted? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, he did release classified. Actually, he had a, a judge said that they released the book early, so they, he couldn't do it. He said, he said hey, he stop but it. he said, this is very dangerous what you've done for yourself. Oh, so what judges say matters then. So shall we uh, just keep Flynn, uh, you know, under prosecution and make sure that Roger Stone goes to jail on July 14th? I mean, if judges are important, if a judge is giving a very strong ruling, if how strong the ruling is, is what's meaningful, then you can't, I mean, compare and contrast these things. And also, any money that you made, that's, uh, you know, good luck. This was a very powerful opinion that we had. No, uh, he's, uh, 
He's sort of a sick guy. There's something wrong with him. But I noticed that earlier. Mm. He made two very bad mistakes. He made a mistake where he talked about the Libyan model. And I won't go to explain that, but some of you understand he was on Deface the Nation. And he talked. Isn't that adorable? About the uh, Libyan who model. Who taught him that? I said, that's a disaster because you know why. And the other thing. Because you know he why. He said going into Iraq was a good thing. Because I said, you know okay, John, but now you know it wasn't, right? No, no, I still think it was. I said, so we're in for $8 trillion in the Middle East, and you think that was a good thing. And I'm pulling out. You know, I'm getting everybody out nice and easy. Everyone's going nicely, going nicely. You think it was good to go into Iraq, go into the Middle East? Yes. Uh, so those two things happened early in his little period of time. He was only there. And by the way, there is no way you don't know those two things about John Bolton. You have, right. You, those aren't things you, you're surprised, like where you're dating somebody for six months and suddenly you find out they're a horrifying racist. You, <laughs> you met them at racism summer camp, you know, where you were doing community service, trying to turn some of these little suckers around and it just failed miserably. Because you know why? Right, why? Yeah. You know, you know the story. You know why? I actually said the phrase that our president just said, and, and because you know why, like a six-year-old, right? And keep in mind, we're because still she likes puppies. We're, this is the argument for the second term. Remember where we were? Okay. Yeah. Sure, well, let's go back. Once to that he said question. those two things, I no longer paid much attention to him, if any. But I'll tell you, he was good for one thing. Everyone thought he was crazy. Because all he wants to do is bomb people. You know, he'll fight Russia. Let's fight Russia. Let's fight China. Let's take them on at the same time. He's crazy. When I walked into a room with him, I knew that. When they saw Bolton, they always gave me what I wanted because they said, Trump's going to drop bombs on me. He's got this maniac with him. So in a way, oh. he helped me in terms of a negotiation. But seriously, he was... Uh, but seriously, I'm just kidding. Uh, he didn't do a good job. He wasn't smart. This is the argument for the second term still. This is compare and contrast. Yep. He wasn't sharp. And he's the only man I think I've ever met. I knew him for a year, one year, whatever the time. It was short time. I don't think I ever saw him smile once. I said to him once, John, do you have a smile? And it tells you something Who's, about does he, it, does he watch? I don't think I've ever seen him smile. I've seen him smile a couple of times. He smiled at that girl who was leaving the stage when he did that, like, Youth for Trump event. We'll be back to caliphate. You got Baghdadi and Associates. You got Soleimani. You got yeah. the Al Qaeda no, we've, leader we've in lot. Yemen. We've done a lot. So back, back. You know, we took out Soleimani, number one terrorist in the world. We took out Al Baghdadi. He was also considered number one. I guess they fought for number one. I got them both. Obama should have gotten Al Baghdadi. But Al Baghdadi wasn't mm. in charge when Obama was in office. By the way, there were like six guys in charge of the ISIS thing. They were they were shrinking at the same time. One of the reasons Trump always is like, sir, we have no ammunition. The reason he thinks that's true is because they wanted more smart bombs because Obama had used up all the smart bombs they had uh, striking ISIS and and had ordered uh, you know whatever 1.5 billion more dollars allocated to the to that than they had the previous year we took them both out uh, we, the we took a hundred percent of the caliphate when I took it over it was all over the place it was a disaster so, uh, that's the ISIS caliphate it won't be oh, yeah just in case you were one in case you thought it was uh, like yesterday I was like it's the Ben and Jerry's caliphate um, <laughs> I always get confused I mix up my caliphate don't you um, when, we come, oh, yeah. when we come back at the top of the hour um, Scott Duff from out Chicago is gonna be with us to talk about Pride Month um, which I feel like on a on a civil rights level is is in the same boat as infrastructure week um is a you know is a rolling presentation of reality in the midst of all this insanity um so we will talk to scott about efforts made to continue what's you know the needed progress for lgbt people and the supreme court case that came down there's a couple more that are coming up as well um it was a shocking and surprising case especially for the trump crowd so uh, we'll talk about that when we come back. It's the House Parks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide on WCPT Radio, Chicago's Progressive Talk. I think we need to record Johnny covering that song, Hal, and start using that. Oh, yeah? Just like that? Yes, just like that. For the, the first hour, we'll use Johnny's. Yeah. That'll the be our happy version. ending music. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. The Muppet version. Just uh, all kazoos. <laughs> I think it's important. Oh, God. Sorry. I farted. <laughs> he asked for a replay. What? He asked for a replay. Oh, God. Sorry. I farted. <laughs> yep. Dr. Evil. I didn't spend six years in evil medical school to be called Mr. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Take off, eh? <laughs> so I've got to start getting better at using all my uh, sound effects. I keep wanting to roll those in. Aiden, why do you keep saying that? I don't understand in chat room. Is that supposed to... Is that what that is? I'm your father, Luke. Give in to the dark side of the force, you knob. <laughs> Sometimes I, in the middle of this... You knob. You know, it's, from, uh, it's from Strange Brew. Oh, you don't have to tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you just sit there and bleed a while before you taste some real pain? All right. Um... <laughs> Is that Dirty Harry? It's a uh, Heartbreak Ridge. Oh yeah, is that after he beat up Mario Van Peebles? Yep. Pulled the earring out of his ear. That's right. Did we see that movie together? I think we did. <laughs> I think we did. In Evanston, so. at the yeah, on uh, you know whatever was that Central? What's the street that? that yeah, I think it was Central. Yeah. Was that like 1986? Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. That's the. I wonder how problematic it is now, but I do oh, remember enjoying it at the time. No, look, I got news for you. Like, as far as I got news for you, as as far as like movies and television go, stuff in the past isn't problematic. It just isn't. It's the past. You, it, you know, if you're still doing it, it's problematic. Yeah, true. Like, you're like, I watched the show. It's very problematic. It's from, you know, like, when's it from? 1972. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. The ink was still wet. It doesn't on make the Breakfast Civil at Rights Tiffany's Act. any easier to watch, though. Yeah, no, I mean, but it's in black and white, and it's ridiculous. <laughs> What's in my water? Uh, I'm. It's uh, goji berries and lemon juice and water. That's it. Yeah, the nicknames he has for everybody in in Heartbreak Ridge uh, would would not stand the test of time. Let's just say. Something strange happened to me this morning. Was it a dream where you see yourself standing in sort of sun god robes on a pyramid with a thousand naked women screaming and throwing little pickles at you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why am I the only person that has that dream? Mm -hmm. Hi, Flora. They've been trying to, uh, like, we were going to do a, uh, um, you know, like, normally there's a pride march and cpt covers it and we do it live oh, yeah. you know, we've done it a couple of years and um and like this year obviously everything gets thrown into a cocked hat so we're trying to do our own kind of semi-live version all the all the people on cpt are having people on as guests to talk about pride oh, okay pride month this week yeah would you classify that as a launch problem or a design problem? <laughs> oh, I, I like I almost clicked on something that will probably that would be uh um this not radio friendly. Yeah. Second yeah. sixty guess. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I almost played this one. To be more uh, to be moronical. An imbecile. Like the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's I was my, waiting for is it. Is that Robert Downey? Yeah, from Tropic Thunder. Yeah, I need to see that movie oh, again. It's so good. It's so good. Didn't he win something for that? Uh, maybe an MTV award or something. He was like nominated that. for Best Actor. Or assist, oh, was assist, he? Uh, best or Best Supporting Actor. Actor. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's a great Because, I mean, come on. It's, a, it's, it, it's as meta as a performance can yeah, get. Oh, three, and he nails it. It's three characters. And I love how people yeah. are like, uh, they used the R word and they were, uh, he was wearing blackface and, and like, it's terrible. And then they're like, he's playing an asshole. That's the point. Yep. That's like saying, you know, why couldn't Thanos be nicer or whatever? Like, you know. Right. And, and, Thanos killed half the people in the universe. I'm kind of digging you know, the <laughs> I've had people walk out of me before, but not when I was being so charming. Streaming at oh, I don't care for you if it's a peeper sludge you're trowling out. A space little pimp stick. True progressive talk. Might be a good time for you guys to give up. Joining us on the phone right now is uh, Scott Duff from out Chicago. Uh, is Scott on the line? Do we have him with us? You better Scott? believe it. How you oh, doing, Hal? I'm Yay! good, Scott. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. And uh, happy pride to you and all the readers slash viewers of out chicago it's you know, we're all across multiple media things these days um your should we just start off right now with your sort of assessment like the state of both chicago and the nation's lgbt standing because i think everybody was really shocked at at the supreme court ruling and and oh my yeah go ahead Girl, no. But when the whole Supreme Court thing came down, like down, yeah. I like got up, grabbed a mask, ran outside, bought some pearls, came back home, washed my hands, and then clutched those pearls. Just to- <laughs> what just happened? Right. What just happened? Yeah. It was like I had no idea that it was going to happen. I was very, very nervous about the whole thing. The fact mm-hmm. that it was a six to three, and the fact that Gorsuch wrote yeah. the decision was like. <laughs> Well, it's so on that yeah. level, it, it was amazing. Right. It's, you know, my, my thing about like conservative judges and why they've always sort of counted on them to be anti LGBT, which always seemed odd to me that they would expect that of them. They may be against them on a personal note. And we're all kind of stuck on where they were on the issue of gay marriage, for example. And they're siding with you know, religious communities saying marriage is really a religious word. Civil unions are what the government does. We can regulate what the government does, but you can't regulate all that. That fight, I think the remnants of that fight are still on people's minds as other rulings come And with this expectation that the conservative judges are going to handle this stuff the way they do it on a, on a sort of just a bigoted version about gay people in general. But when it comes to workplace stuff, hiring and firing and offering people jobs and making sure that there's equal protection under the law based on either someone's immutable characteristics, which is set in stone, or outside of work behaviors as you perceive them, which is even the weirder part of it, the court seems to be fundamentally on the side of LGBTQ rights simply because if you don't, the slippery slope legally for them, and this seems to be why Gorsuch and the rest of them, you know, the, and Alito, I think, or was it Roberts, sided with the the minority in this. And, I mean, I guess technically you can't even say that. They were the majority. The yeah. majority <laughs> response um, was, was in this direction because they recognize that if you try to limit people's ability to be themselves on these fronts, you also open up a legal Pandora's box for any behavior. Than anybody, and and it goes back to Jews not being allowed to go to Mar-a-Lago like they used to not be allowed to go to, and uh, you know, and women's rights and all these things. It would it would fundamentally allow them to dial back all these kind of things. So I, I'm always you know amazed why conservatives think that conservative judges will fall on this side based on some sort of biblical principle. Yeah, it's kind of mind boggling. And yeah. just even the whole issue, you know, uh, just the, the whole thing about how, you know, equal rights for all does not mean less rights for you. Like mm-hmm. that whole that whole principle is just mind boggling. It's, it's weird. It's um, it's screwy. But, and, yeah. you know, and especially because they've claimed the word freedom so soundly. We believe in freedom. It's the freedom 
of every American and the rights and because I'm an American. Yeah. I mean, he plays Lee Greenwood at every campaign stop where at least <laughs> I know I'm free. Like in spite of anything, I'm proud to be an American because where at least I know I'm free. That is the primary thought of that entire mantra in that song. And yet their modus operandi when it comes to LGBTQ folks is the elimination of those rights. And the, and the limiting yeah. of the rights of your fellow Americans based on your own perception of their worth, their morality, their, uh, you know, physical being. It's goofy. It's weird. Yeah, it is. It's really, really goofy. And I think one of the biggest things that uh, hopefully the, as we move forward uh, with our mm -hmm. fight for equality and fight for equal rights really comes down to, you know, education and representation. We are lucky here in Illinois that they have just passed a um, LGBTQ curriculum uh, law mm -hmm. stating that in, well, whenever, whenever we go back to school, who knows when that is, but when we go back to school for the next school year, that uh, states, uh, high schools are required to teach queer history at, mm -hmm. in their history books. Like that is mm -hmm. going to be a thing when people realize that, oh, the guy that uh, helped end World War you know, II, Alan, Alan Turing, Turing like, yep. He was a big old homo. Like, oh, great. That's Ooh. awesome. When we see that, you know. <laughs> he you know, he was a big old homo. He, uh, for the record, hey. for the record, uh, he was a he was a British uh, uh, gay man. So I don't even know if they do big old anything over there, especially they were very buttoned down even still. Um, Alan Turing. That's very true. That's very, very uh, you true. Know, yeah. Alan, Alan Turing was amazing. And some of his staff were also gay and they worked very hard at saving lives. And what was the story, the, you know, interestingly enough, the queer history of Alan Turing in, in this generation and maybe the last two generations, the surprising part for a lot of people was not that Alan Turing was gay and that he contributed to beating the, uh, you know, the Axis. And if without him, we'd have lost World War II. It's very possible. The, the surprising part for most people that was that he was chemically castrated by the British yeah. court system for being gay. For simply being gay, he was not. We're not talking about a, pedof a pedophile who agreed to do that so they could, you know, not be locked up. That kind of stuff. He was not a serial rapist who had agreed to the exact thing. Alan Turing was simply chemically castrated for being gay, um, and that part yeah. of the story, yeah. I think, is is a is the part that shocked most people when the movie Imitation Game came out. When the story was finally told about him, that was the only part that people were surprised about. And I think that's part of what people need to know, it wasn't, if for this generation, my generation, I, I've i grown up, I've been lucky to grow up, and I grew up in Chicago, I went to high school in Chicago, with a pretty open attitude amongst all my friends, but for the rare exception, towards gay and lesbian people. Um, and transgenderism has now gotten a, uh, you know, has certainly been in the press more, but it was less of a an issue it, you know, decried during that time. I think there are generations that believe this. I think what is missing from the history of it is the recognition that these people not only did extraordinary things, but did extraordinary things while they were in danger of dying simply for being themselves. Yeah. Which is the extra absolutely, level of strength absolutely. that makes and, them heroes. And how important heroes. That, I think was what, what, uh, why it was so important for, uh, you know, the state of Illinois to pass this bill, just in, again, right. because when you if you have a young queer kid sitting in a classroom who, you know, might not be out or is questioning their gender expression right. or trying to figure things out, and they see examples of people who have done extraordinary things under such duress that it can only help, A, yes. helps queer youth, but it also helps everybody move the, the thing forward, saying, like, look, why are you so worried about where I may or may not put my ding dong? Just stop right. it. You know, it, it, is, it is, I don't think about what, I don't, sitting around and wonder what you're doing in your bedroom yeah. you know it, it's just the, the focus on the well you're in a you're in a very small crowd because uh, a lot of, a lot of people are very curious about my bedroom uh quite frankly i mean uh, considering well, uh, well, the, number bedrooms, the number of bedrooms the number of bedrooms i've been in on television it you know it, it, it there's just a lot of discussion um but i will <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I i will say this that i think there's a a an element to both education and the, the mutual respect aspect, I think, is the goal of, of LGBT education in, you know, in schools, is the idea that eventually there's this understanding of contribution and equality so that we can all get on with it. 
You know, that, that when you don't erase the past and the worth of people, you operate on the same ground that, that, that they're on. Uh, you, you share the same ground. And that's the promise of America. That's the entire point of it. So that's a really beautiful thing. Now I want to ask you, um, can you stick around through the break? Because we got to take a break right now. But can you stick around? Because I'd like to ask yeah, you about the, the, the future struggles and anything that's coming up to the Supreme Court that, you know, we should be aware of that, you know, maybe the listener hasn't heard about or or in any way, by the way, that we can be of service and help both as allies and our LGBTQ listeners. So um, I appreciate you hanging with us. It's the House Marks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide on WCPT Radio, Chicago's Progressive Talks, WCPT820.com, 773-763-9278 is the number. We'll be back right after this. Is my typing super loud? It's super loud. <laughs> but yeah, type quietly. Groovy. Um, are you? Are, were you typing in the chat? No, I was actually responding to a Facebook message. Facebook? What are you, a Russian spy? Uh huh. <laughs> Everybody in the chat room, super loud. <laughs> Feel like a Kentucky Fried Idiot. All right. All right. A membrane keyboard maybe would help? Yeah. Um, Johnny has one of Alan Turing's original keyboards, so he's very proud mm -hmm. of this. Uh, thank you, Christina. I don't know why my, uh, my streaming software is like, the, again, the software itself is frozen, so I can't change the picture, which is fine because we're... You and me, you and I together. She walks in, and I'm suddenly a hero. No. All begins to rise. I don't know why I have that song stuck in my head. It's from the Xanadu soundtrack. Nice. Xanadu is one of my wife's, um, like... Comfort movies? It's a big childhood memory, but it's, like, one that is not entirely <laughs> fun. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. But she knows every lyric to every song, yeah. but sometimes it's just too much to handle. I'm alive. I'm alive. And the world shines on me today. I'm alive. Oh, yeah, I know it. Yeah, you do. One of the first guitar licks I ever copped from another song was from Lover Won't Take a Backseat Tonight, that split song that they did where it was like ELO and her and back and forth. And it was a down, dick it down, and dick down, down, dick it down, dick it down. Wow, no, I don't know that one. Yeah, so I, I would sit down there in, in Mike's basement while you guys were drinking Diet Cokes and eating uh, vitamin C chewables as snacks. And, uh, and, okay, Johnny's hot and loud. Right, well, that's true. Uh. This is Tom Harvin, and you're listening to the Hal Sparks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide on Chicago's Progressive Talk, WCPT. Welcome back. So um, uh, Scott Duff from out Chicago is with us, and uh, we were just talking about the uh, shocking turn of events in the Supreme Court last week, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the the next battles, the next challenges. I, you know, I am, I'm beginning to move away in my own discourse, away from the words fighting for things, because A, no one ever does. It's not actually how you get things done. Most of it is done through understanding and empathy over time, especially if this yeah. stuff sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you make permanent change, it's because people understand and the public changes, you know, I, I'm of the... I'm of the firm belief that um, more Americans were for gay marriage than people thought. It was just how they were. Sh the question was being shaped when they were asked. You know, if if it means taking something from mm -hmm. you, are you for it? Uh, the question suddenly didn't have as much as is it fine if they do it if it doesn't affect you. That's a totally different question about the exact same thing, and it got us a, a, a very different answer, and it changed the tide of how people 
perceive each other. So what do you see as the the necessary changes going forward that are in front of us, you know, maybe before the Supreme Court or in other uh, legal venues or what have you? Well, I think right now the uh, queer community is really taking a good look at cleaning up their own house uh, at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. With, with all of the with all of the unrest and uh, the protests that have been happening uh, in response to, you know, all of the the, the, the actions of police right now, and right. really looking at uh, racism within the LGBTQ community. I know mm. here in Chicago, that's been a very very big issue. Um, you know, we have we we are lucky enough to have a place you know that is dedicated, uh, quote unquote, a dedicated queer space. You know, in Boys Town here right. in Chicago. Uh, but there are black and brown people bodies who just do not feel safe there. Uh, last year, there was a big scandal because one of the bars there sent out an email saying to all of their DJs saying that we will not be playing rap music. There is no rap music that will be played in this bar, which mm. is not so coded uh, to um, saying, you know, who we want to be here uh right you know with all of the protests that have been happening and a lot of focus have been looking at you know the the calculated murder of trans women of color especially black trans women uh right. not only here in chicago but just across the country that is a huge huge thing so i think we as a queer community are really looking inward to be like okay what are we doing to um a deal with uh deal with the issues of the policing deal with uh right. you know systemic racism that that is within our community mm-hmm. uh, that is a huge one and one of the things that I think is really kind of cool you know but because of the pandemic we are and because of the the civil unrest and all the people who have been amazing going to the streets uh, for Black Lives Matter it's really making uh, the community kind of remember that the first pride was a riot. It was not, you know, brought to you by Citibank or Miller Beer. Mm-hmm. If you've got the time, we've got the queers, Miller Beer. Right. You know, right. it was a people who are just had had enough. And it was led by. Well, they were also in the uh, process uh, of being arrested. Trans- they were uh, they were in the, you know, the, yeah. the Stonewall Stonewall riots started because of a police raid. It was, you know, it, the, the rioting aspect rolled off of that, but it was directly related to uh, overreach and over-policing After, in that regard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. a never-ending series of police raids, and that's, that's when right. it happened. And it, and it started, and the people who led this movement uh, were trans women of colors, were, were the, the big dykes, were the big sissy queens, people who could not pass, as it were, and they had right. just had enough. And they took to the streets and it became a social a movement. And I think because Pride is now can't, has been canceled this year mm-hmm. in terms of the big celebratory Pride Parade, uh, right. it is now there are several organizations that are gathering together to like, all right, well, now let's turn this into let's reclaim Pride. Let's have, have Pride without prejudice. Uh, there were mm-hmm. two marches that were scheduled to take place tomorrow, which would have been the Pride Parade. Right. Um, one of them actually was canceled. Uh, that was having it was like it was the black trans lives matter of uh, uh, black lives matter pride protest uh when uh an organization called brave space alliance which is Lesia wade who is the founder and executive director of this place is a force of nature it is the mm-hmm. only organization in the state of illinois that is for uh black and brown trans people and it was led by trans people and is com- comprised by trans people and she called them out she said look these organiz- the organizers they have been, this is supposed to be against police brutality they've been working with the police to make sure that they are there on mass they are not highlighting uh trans voices in fact there are non-queer voices that are going to be giving a, a, a a platform and she's like again we're feeling like we're being token this is nothing but tokenism so fortunately Hmm. they actually the organizers of that heard her they canceled their uh their event and are putting all of the resources into another march which is the pride without prejudice that takes place tomorrow at noon uh right in the heart of boys town uh so i think that is where we're moving we really need to we're all looking at all of the, 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 uh, the forces that are keeping people down right now. And right now, uh, especially in the queer community, it's about, you know, it's hard as being yeah. a cis white well, guy. Well, I mean, looking at, your, voice, looking, at your, yeah, looking at yourself, right, and, and, and trying to yeah. go, what, what part do I play and how do I fix this is, is adulthood. And, uh, and a lot of movements grow up 
over time. They start out as, you know, a, a lot of a lot of things that start with riots are the sort of youthful, exuberant fight back against something, and then they mature into actual change. That's what you hope for everything. I mean, the we're not we the United States hasn't been in the Revolutionary War since <laughs> the 1700s is you know is kind of the point. So um and in I'm always curious about this um in terms of how the community deals with this because as an ally and as somebody who you know was on queers folk you know was involved in the first HIV positive uh relationship and then marriage on American television multiple stories about gay adoption um and relationships at, that we dealt with, you know, some people are like, well, you know, Queer's Folk wasn't as inclusive as it should have been as far as the people that we had on the show um, racially or what have you. When And that's always the argument between do you do an aspirational show or a realistic show? And, and yeah. I was shocked to find out when we started doing the show, because it never occurred to me. I was just there to play a character. That was the script. It was based on a British show. The characters were cast to reflect that British show in some ways, whatever. And... I was surprised at the language around people of other races and the interracial dating in the gay community amongst the extras and people we were around. I was shocked at sort of the overt racial language because having oh, dated yeah. a, a, a black female myself at one point in high school, having dated people of, multi, uh, of different races my entire life without any real regard for you know, that was a standard about them. It was just the human being. That was just the package that human being came in. And it was, it was, it made them both attractive, uh, but also didn't supersede their identity in any way. It was just them. It was just the person, right? That it never, uh, you know, I don't yeah. really think that deeply about it, but there was a lot of specific language that seemed very, uh, frankly, racist, that I was hearing nicknames for what people who date certain people were called. And those kind of, like, I was amazed. I have to yeah. say, I and, was and, and unfortunately yeah. that is still, that is still going on, right. uh, you know, in the form of all of these dating apps. There are a lot of people who out there who, um, under the guise of being specific, mm -hmm. I guess, <laughs> um, right. they still spout, you know, like, you know, uh, racist, transphobic, like body shaming, like there are all these these words that are still in use. And I think that's what I mean when when the queer mm -hmm. community really needs to go inside. Because right. here's the thing, we're, you know, as the LGBTQ community, we, we have a very big umbrella. We got one of everybody mm -hmm. underneath That was there. what the rainbow so flag's like, all about, want, right. That would be indeed, but we really need to make sure that, okay, so, as society as a whole is grappling with these issues of racism and and violence against people, um, we as a community need to look inside, especially gay men, because they are the biggest perpetrators of this, I think. Uh, we really need to look in at ourselves and say, okay, how am I contributing to this mess? How am I contributing to the danger gotcha. that I'm putting people in? And what can I do to fix that? I, I think right. We, right now the I, next big step really is cleaning up our own house. Right. I, I, my, and my last question, because we only got a couple minutes left, is, you know, in, in working with GLAAD and HRC and all these organizations and being very aware of the studies that they do on LGBT rights and, and having spoken at a bunch of these events as an ally, as, you know, as a straight white male, for all practical purposes, um, you know, I feel like I have a, a a unique view of the of the ground in this community because of the role that I played yeah. and the pe and the friends that I've had and the situation that's around my, you know, um, they did a report. HRC did a report about uh, violence against trans women, specifically trans women of color, being on the rise without addressing who the threat is from and how the threat actually expresses itself. And that's been, uh, you know, one in six of the trans women that have been killed in the last, every year for the last five years specifically where they've been doing this particular study is, inter, is, is domestic violence, is partner-based violence. 
And yet yeah. HRC, HRC still lists it as anti-trans violence. And for me, I feel like this erases some of the progress in, you know, that society is making. That as unfortunate as these deaths are and as horrifying as they are, they fall into a world that all races, all genders are in, which is the scourge of domestic violence and how to handle it. And what's happening is more of them are encountering this in relationships that they are in. And so the, the question is, you could draw attention to something only for so long before you have to find the solution to stopping the violence. You know, um, and, and I just don't see in, in the laws that are, you know, people are seeking to implement a banning chokeholds kind of version of a law that addresses the violence towards trans women of color. Murder is still illegal. Assault is still illegal. Is it simply the resources that trans women of color have to go to when they're in danger? Is it, is it specific shelters for them? I mean, the center on Halstead is an amazing space. Um, I, my thing is, how do we solve it? How do we stop that violence in its tracks? Who is perpetrating it mostly, and how do you end it? it? Well, that's yeah. okay. Well, there's a big question, right? In, in the few minutes that we have left, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's one of the, uh, you know, I I don't know. I'm not familiar yeah. with that HRC study, so I'll have to go and look at that. So I can't speak to yeah. that directly. But I do mm -hmm. think that a lot of it comes down to what we were talking about earlier about empathy, about mm -hmm. seeing how um, trans people have been represented in the media. There's an amazing new documentary out on Netflix called Disclosure, and I think everybody should watch it. It uh, kind of picks up where that doc the celluloid closet from the 90s mm -hmm. left off, and it fills in right. the holes to look at how you know, trans people are being represented as the butt of the joke, as a, uh, a, a danger to people, as, you know, people who are deranged, people who are sneaky and devious and they have a secret that they're hiding right. from. I think right. it all comes down to, you know, when you know somebody, it is, it's harder to hate somebody, you know, like you yeah. can see like where they come from. And I, I know we again, go, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree on on the broader social aspect of this. I'm speaking to the specific violence that they experience. Now, there's an idea that marginalized people tend to be at the effect of violence because there's fewer people to protect them around, or they have fewer, you know, resources as far as reaching out. My, you know, I I just hope we can find those resources for them. Um, is my regard. And I, you know, in full confession. My first my first two experiences in the media of trans people or people who would be you know, seen as trans in media was the storyline in uh, everything you wanted to know about sex, but were afraid to ask by Woody Allen about uh, the man who cross dresses, yeah. the guy who was in the old donut commercials. He was he was the time to make the donuts actor um, who changes yeah. into a some a, a, they're visiting somebody he changes the clothes, falls out the window, ends up on the street. People are addressing him as a woman until they see his mustache. And then that's kind of the like his wife catches him. They end the, the that little episode of it with him and his wife sitting there on a bed and the wife going, why couldn't you have just told me? Why couldn't you have just said something? You would have said to me, Martha, I'm a sick person. Something's wrong, you know, and that's the joke. Like she seemed, the, the yeah. joke is she's being supportive and then she makes a left turn. But then right after she says that, she goes, the look on their face when they saw you in that dress, like they shared a moment again. There was, I very distinctly remember the normalcy of this couple at the end of this thing, even in the reaction that was supposed to be comedic about it. The other one, of course, was the black trans uh, prostitute in Risky Business. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yep. You know, film, filmed in Chicago. It's a good old Chicago film. Um, deepest voice of any oh, human yeah. being I've heard since, you know, uh, like Darth Vader. And um, she goes, you know, Joel, if you let me in, I can call a cab or whatever. He, she introduces yeah. him to no, no, no. the Rebecca. I, yeah, I re you remember that character? I, actually, yeah, I remember that character. And they actually talk about that, that character in Disclosure. It, you know, yeah. it's, it's, again, it's being told that you are the butt of the joke. You are less than but in this case, because you it, are leading it, your authentic. I've, here's my thing, though. As, power, as, a, is... as a young man, as a young man who was straight and watching that movie as a young straight man, the reaction that he has both to her as a trans woman, his respectful, like, yeah, I, um, 
uh, I, you're not who I meant to call or whatever. Never calling her a name, never vilifying her, him going, this isn't who you want, this is who you want. I know who, I know who wants me, I know who you want or whatever. The, the, the odd, I, I think it's seen from the community in a different way than it's seen by the straight community, perhaps. And that character to me was actually one of the pivotal, respectful characters that I'd seen in my life of somebody portrayed in that moment where I was like, oh, what a, that, that person does what they do. Well, there's nothing wrong with them. They're a complete human being. That's who they are. They were never the butt of that joke. The joke was Joel's reaction in it. So I think there's been m uh, movements forward is my, is my take on it in that regard. But what I would say for us as, a, you know, as people is I'm glad everyone's coming to this recognition of what these things mean to us and how we progress in mutual respect and honor. You know, that's, that, you know, we've been phasing through this for a long time, it seems. And yet there's a bit of a quickening now. And it's amazing to hear that the LGBTQ community is coming to, uh, you know, coming to its own recognition of its limitations in that regard, just like the straight community has been for a very long time, you know. Um, and so uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe that's the bonding point. Maybe that's the recognition point. Maybe that's one of those areas where, you know, one of the ways you can bond with another human being you have very little in common with is looking them in the eyes and honestly, both of you saying, we both have a lot of work to do. And um, we, yeah, we went way no, over the- I totally the... agree. I think that, that is definitely doing it. And, and again, one of those ways is getting uh, those stories out and told so that it, mm -hmm. people aren't others. That's it right. It becomes something more familiar. You Education. Know, and, and, yep. and just speaking as, as a as a gay man who grew yeah. up, you know, in the in the nineties and everything, yeah. I I just want to thank you for mm -hmm. for the work that you've done uh, as an ally for the community. But really, watching queer as folk, it was like, oh, there I am. I see mm -hmm. me, and I have a normal life, you know, and yeah. I'm a regular person. So it it matters. It really does I, matter. So I, thank I, you for the work I, that you have done. No, and thank you. For, to do. Thanks for being on here with me. I you know one of the moments I had and one of the weirdest moments of my creative life was a moment where I confronted the executive producers of the show, two gay men who had been working very hard trying to create a show like this for a very long time. So who am I to tell them what to do? But they were going to have a scene early in the second season where Michael was going to come out of the closet. And I, having grown up around two friends who were closeted until they were adults and had moved entirely away from the states they lived in and who were still not completely out with the people that they were around, recognize that there were a lot of people who did not have the ability to be out and safe and live a, you know, a, you know, a prideful experience. And Michael at that point was the only character in the show who had any situation where he was not out. And I was like, somebody needs to be the representative for those folks. And partly it was growing up in Kentucky, having relatives in Tennessee and, and Louisiana and Georgia and Northern Florida who had to deal with this bigotry all the time that you don't see in West Hollywood necessarily. And you certainly don't see even in Toronto where we were filming on the scale that you would. And, and I was like, that, here I was, this little straight white guy playing this role, coming up to them and going, I think Michael should stay in the closet as far as the story goes. Because there are, there are people going through that experience and someone has to represent that. And they did. And yeah. I, you know, th yeah, yeah. that ended up, being the end of the series was Michael being sort of forced to come out by being blown up, but the that's what it took. But you know yeah. that's that yeah, yeah. became well, that, so you know, crucial. That story is still going on right now. That's right. That's right. And I, and I, it still hasn't died down. Yeah, I, you know, and, right. Well, I I appreciate it. We're like I said, yeah. we went way past our break. We got to uh, take off. But I thank you for being with me. I thank you for speaking so frankly and having a fantastic conversation about this. Out Chicago, of course, is. Uh, is is crucial to the LGBTQ community in, in Chicago. And the center in Halstead, I have to say, and I still will say to this day, is the best LGBT center I've ever set foot in in my life. And I've been in almost all of them in the United States at one time or another, uh, you know, to see, to see or speak. And I like I appreciate the work that they do there. Um, also, people be aware of the Trevor Project. Um, support any, you know, uh, Pride committees, HRC, and GLAD can always use your money and your support as well. Um, and I appreciate you being with us today, uh, Scott. Hey, thanks Cheers. so much for having me. Happy Absolutely. All right, we'll 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 be back right after this. It's the House Parks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide.
it's hard to cut a conversation like that short because there's so much to Seriously. unpack. You know. Yeah, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. What were you thinking? So, yeah. Like, you know, it's so funny because I, having grown up with hair metal and all that kind of stuff, like, I just, you know, and Rob Halford coming out of the closet and knowing Freddie Mercury was gay, like, like, the all the rock bands I hung around with didn't give a shit. We just didn't care. Yeah. Like two decades ahead of everything on gay rights in that regard. Because it was, you had no hard feelings against anybody in that regard. Like, what am I going to get upset because a guy's wearing girlish clothes? I'm a Twisted Sister fan. Are you kidding me? The six right. foot five and he's wearing ladies lingerie. He looks like a linebacker. It's, what are you talking about? Like who, you know. Um, yeah, so. Did you ever get to see Twisted Sister live? Did I what? Did you ever get to see them live, yeah. Twisted Sister? Yeah, in, um, was it 87? Where was it? Aragon Ballroom? I gotta remember where it was. It wasn't a big venue. Oh, a big venue. Back in 60 guys and Thank full you. phone line tell. No doubt. There you go. Um, I saw them open up for Iron Maiden in 1985. At the old Rosemont Horizon. Open for Iron Maiden? Wow. Yep. Yeah, it was a contentious bill. Yeah, I you know, from an album standpoint, I can see that a little bit. But as far as their live performance goes, not as far off as you would think. Because those songs play, yeah. they play a lot heavier. It's like listening to yeah. I Was Made For Loving You live versus the recorded yeah, version. Yeah. Like it, it sounds and like... they had like all the... They had the pink chain link fence up there, and like it was, it was a heavy show. And he jumped into the audience and tried to beat somebody up because they had like a, a circle slash twisted sister sign. Is that like no twisted sister? Right. He's like, oh, that's really fucking cute. Yeah, and <laughs> as you and do. he jumped out there, I, and I was so sick. I had like the flu or something, I'm but I could Jason not not go. Show. And here is the mega worldwide radio program with Hal Sparks. That's right. He'll, <laughs> we'll get it right one day. I will get him to read yeah. it at some point. Uh, we have full phone line, 773-763-9278. Who do we have first, uh, Devin? First, we got Richard out in Chicago. Cool. Hey, Richard. Welcome. Hi, Hal. Hi, Johnny. How you doing? Good. Doing Thanks good. Thanks for being with us. Listen, Hal, you guys know me better as Richard Custer. Oh, Richard! Patreon oh, yeah. assemble. Richard's in our chat room. Thanks for calling Patreon's in, Richard. Assemble. Patreon's assemble. Patreon's <laughs> assemble. Um, thanks for calling in, Richard. Listen, That's amazing. How, uh, yeah, go ahead. No problem. Listen, I, I wanted to call now. Make this quick. Uh, mm -hmm. This whole Russian bounty scandal. I mm -hmm. truly believe. When I first heard it yesterday, I yes. truly believe this was going to be. Trump's Waterloo. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Because I think there's a groundswell around this as well. I think you're right. Yes, because even though I was briefly in the military, I was in the Navy back in mm -hmm. the 80s, even though I was briefly there, I understood that culture more so right. than Trump does. And mm -hmm. if if the allegations are true, which I believe that they are, the military will turn against them. Trust yeah. me. Trust me on this. Mm -hmm. You don't, if we have no confidence in our leader, we yeah. will revolt. We will, put, we, it, it, it's going to be his undoing. Yeah. I also I, believe I, in the media, we need to push this hard. Mm -hmm. People need to rec this cannot be allowed to drift away into nothing. We we lost 10 Green Berets and 10 other soldiers last year. Like, I'm going to guess if you're asking for a bounty from people. Afghans to kill them, how many how many of those were the Green Berets? How many of those? Because those are the people on, you exactly. know, are pushing forward and doing exactly. stuff. Those are the crucial, highly trained military people. Those are the people the Russians would want dead. Those bounties were paid. 
Um, and that means those the Russia took out a hit on specific U.S. troops, right. paid the uh, paid the bounty, right. and those people died. Um, I, I I agree. Right. I think uh, this one this is heartbreaking on a bunch of fronts. But again, Trump and right after this it, was saying we me, need to get me, Russia back into the right. G seven, like immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let me say this. It's not just bounties on American soldiers. There were also bounties on British soldiers. That's right. So, okay, and keep that in mind. I'm telling if you. That if that hadn't happened, by the way, Richard, if that hadn't they? happened, we wouldn't necessarily even be hearing this story because it was they had to inform the, the British of the intelligence that they had. We share our intelligence with the Brits. And the Brits reacted to How? this like you would. Yeah. Like you would. But keep, yeah. it, but keep in mind, mm -hmm. the British, uh, like, like ourselves, we mm -hmm. did, they didn't know about this until just possibly the other day. Right. Trump has known this even before he was um, impeached. I honestly yes. believe that. Yes. He knew this before. Agreed. So with all that being said, you guys have a nice weekend, okay? Thank you, Richard. Love you. Let's it's awesome Richard. to have you check. Let's game. Let's game. I'm f do you get you got your headset? Did it come in the mail? I got it. All right. It's on. I That's it. it. We're gonna we're gonna do it. Okay. Um uh, thanks so much for calling in. Always lovely to have you. Everybody in the chat room saying hi to you as well. Um uh let's see. We've got I'm going to take a break right now simply because we burned through the other one and uh, we'll get the rest of the calls as best we can on the other side of this break. We'll be back right after this. It's the House Parks Radio program, Mega Worldwide on WCPT Radio, Chicago's Progressive Talk. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate that. Welcome. How are you? That's really awesome. If you don't say so yourself, Jess. <laughs> oh, so, oops. Right, there you go. Yeah, thanks, Jess, dollface. Appreciate it. Oh, we got, there you go, thanks. Subscribe for two months. That's awesome. You guys can uh, use your Amazon Prime memberships to subscribe to the Twitch channel. I'm just saying, doesn't cost you a cent. Just something you can do. Helps the show. Good way to support it. Or you can become a patron, like Richard calls you out to do. Patreon.com slash Al Sparks. Um, we're shooting for 500. We're coming back. I can always tell when it's you're 60 seconds, guys. Yeah, I can always tell when your mic goes live because I hear like a, a minor reflection of my voice just for a split second. Oh God! This the the I have the Guardian story on the um on the Trump. Rage mounts over report Russia offered bounties to Afghanistan militants for killing U.S. soldiers. Um, even the Guardian puts it as U.S. soldiers. They were trying to, they killed British soldiers too. Yeah, let me pull it up. There's a follow up by the Washington Post. Hold on. Open link in the attendance. Welcome back to the Hal Sparks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide. Now time for the happy ending. Yay! Uh, the happy ending would be the ending of Trump's presidency early, but uh, we'll, it, it, which we may be talking about, according to Rick Wilson, if he decides he's just not going to lose uh, a four in a 400 electoral vote landslide, that he might just drop the mic and split and let Mike Pence take care of stuff. Um, we've got three articles. Um, New York Times first broke this story that Richard was bringing up um, that says uh, Russia secretly offered Afghan militants bounties to kill U.S. troops. The Guardian followed up with their own article, Outrage Mounts Over Report Russia Offered Bounties to Afghanistan Militants for Killing U.S. Soldiers. They also offered bounties on British soldiers. 
Thank you, Kelly. Thanks to everybody for super chatting in the in at infotainmentwars.com to support the show. I love and appreciate you guys. It's awesome. And to all of our patrons as well for keeping this show on the air. Uh, you are our lifeblood, and we appreciate you. Um, outrage mounts over report. Russia uh, offered bounties to Afghan militants for killing U.S. soldiers. They paid the bounties, for the record. The outrage is, you know, they can offer a bunch of stuff. They actually paid for it. The uh, Washington Post is writing Russian operation targeted coalition troops in Afghanistan intelligence finds. A Russian military spy unit offered bounties to Taliban-linked militants to attack coalition forces in Afghanistan, including U.S. and British troops, in a striking escalation of the Kremlin's hostility towards the United States, American intelligence has found. Donald Trump has never had a bad word about Vladimir Putin the entire time he's been in his office, and after he got this intel, wanted Russia added to the G7. Just for the record, uh, this this we're finding out about this. They had this meeting before Trump started pushing again for them for us to include Russia in the G7. He also is removing forces from Germany, NATO forces from Germany, which would uh, the only country in the world that would want that is Russia. It's insane that this is not a, a bigger story than it already is. It's disgusting. Um, let's take another call. Um, who do we have, Devin? I we got our friend Old Bob out in Indiana. Old Bob's with us. We got an Old Bob check-in. Thank God. Old Bob, how are you? Hey, are you with us? Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm with you, and, and I hope you uh, kids are doing okay. We're holding it together. And uh, I'm going to get off the horn now because I want to listen to you talk to someone smart. Good <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, old Bob. We're just glad to hear you're okay. We love when he, when he checks in with us. We're glad you're staying healthy and secure. Please continue to do so. Um, and we'll talk to you again. Check in with us earlier next time. Who else do we have, Devin? Next, we got George from the South Side. Cool. Hey, George. Thank you, Colonel Sparks, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, um... absolutely. Uh, at ease. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. And I'll have a mint julep, if you please. Um, I don't drink on duty. We'll have uh, talk Donald to the quartermaster. And it, <laughs> given Donald Trump's uh, well-known proclivities and attitudes towards women, it mm -hmm. wouldn't surprise me if Mary Trump's book has some really devastating incidents to report. I mean, we're all in remember yeah. the Donald's remark that if Ivanka wasn't his daughter, he'd want to date her and his invasion of the dressing room at the junior Miss pageant, wandering right. around all the underage girls. And of course the Billy Bush interview, uh, it would be hangout. If Mary Trump being the well-established, uh, clinical psychologist that she is, will be able to recount in professional detail, any incidents within the mm -hmm. family where Donald Trump made untoward advances towards female family members, including perhaps she herself, his niece. Well, we'll uh, we shall see what the, you know, I, I, I know the book's going to come out. I know they're going to fail. Their, their, you know, legal attempt to stop it this week failed miserably. They were using the idea that she signed an NDA and her uh, inheritance is, it predicates on her staying, sticking to the NDA. At this point, if you're warning people about someone who you consider a danger to the public, NDAs are uh, null and void. And if her book comes out, and, and I mean, just look at the title. But like, I think it's like, How My Family Created the Most Dangerous Man in the World. Um, that's precisely what she's doing. The title itself makes it legal. I, you know, we've all seen the pictures of him with, uh, you know, uh, Ivanka sitting on his lap and the like. It is a frightening sight. It is very odd. Um, that interview he did with Don Jr. even with he's totally ignoring Don Jr. And it's clear that somebody's standing off screen telling him how, basically how to talk to his own son. There's such a mess going on there. I don't know if there will be any stories of him being untoward towards family relatives. I do think there's a chance that there will be stories of how he behaved at family gatherings with other people's wives and other people's friends. 
that are on par with how he treats women. Uh, that would not surprise me at all if it, if every other book written about the man is, uh, you know, except the ones he's had ghost written for him, is indicative. So, and this, uh, yeah, this may this may not be exactly on target, but the confidentiality privilege that uh, a patient has with a psychotherapist uh, does not preclude the psychotherapist from warning the authorities or nope. interested parties if that patient is clearly in imminent danger. Right. And she I think wrote, you can uh, extend she, that principle to this book. Yeah, she wrote a book. Uh, she co- like she was the, uh, I guess, the the clinical basis for a book on schizophrenia, but she also did a report on stalkers specifically. And the, just the curious nature of that particular mindset and what drew her to talking about that and Trump's sort of creepy, obsessive behavior. Even in that, remember the Taco Bowl picture for Cinco de Mayo, where yeah. you could see the, the British Sudafed in the drawer behind him, the kind that has a higher meth content in it and that people you know crush and snort. And under the pile of magazines on his desk where he's eating his taco bowl, one of them, it was a People magazine open to pictures of his ex-wife. While he's married to Melania, he had pictures of um, uh, what the, his, I guess, technically his second wife in a bathing suit. Marla Maples. You, yeah, Marla Maples. You could see her, like the magazine poking out from under. And then she's going to write a, you know, she becomes uh, like... His brother's daughter is writing stories about stalkers. The, the mentality of this dude laid bare and how afraid they are of this particular take. Because Bolton's book, read it for free. Don't pay a dime for it. That guy's a cretin. Birds of a feather. I mean, they're the same fleas on the same kind of dog. I don't care. But Mary's book is going to be hard for him to knock down because it's a family member calling out them. And she was also, by the way, the source for the tax fraud allegation story that came out that made Mar- uh, um, the, the older sister of Donald Trump step down from her judgeship. She was the, Mary Trump was the source on that. So, uh, and it, and, and apparently one of the people working on that story is the one who, you know, snuck off and helped her co-write her book because he was like, this is a giant story. Um, it's one of the reasons why the tax story fell apart at the New York Times because those reporters got, you know, one of them split to write this book with her. Um, but you're you're absolutely right that it it is going to be equal parts frightening and salacious. I don't doubt it. The big story is really how he's not going to be able to knock it down. Um, we have like three minutes left. Let me grab another caller. I appreciate the call, um, uh, and we will talk to you again. Who else do we have, Devin? Next, we got Paul out in Wisconsin. Excellent. Hey, Paul. Are you there? Yeah. How are you yeah. doing? Uh, I'm good. Go ahead. Um, you know, if you want to get rid of pre- prejudice, people, and you want to make this go away, quit talking about it. The news media, it's the only thing in town besides this so-called pandemic. Now, I find it pretty strange. Wait, so-called? The Democrats have been oh, going the, after the, Trump for is two it, years Is it now. so-called? Wait Got a minute, it? hold on. So so-called pandemic, or did you say so-called plandemic? I call it a plandemic. I see. Why would you call what? it a plandemic? Well, it's pretty obvious. What's it, what are the odds of all of a sudden we have this pandemic when you've been trying to get rid of Trump for three years, and all of a sudden out of nowhere oh, so it's personal. so-called so, virus? I see. So uh, AIDS it, was... AIDS was created to get rid of Carter. Is that is that what we're doing? Ebola was created, an H1N1 just pop up to get rid of Obama because Trump was a birther. Maybe he's just because incapable of actually that. handling he real real tests. I mean, maybe he's just maybe maybe just maybe he's incompetent. Perhaps I appreciate the call though. Uh, thanks you guys for listening. It's the House Parks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide. We're out of time. We're uh, we're at the tail end of the show. I hope that guy calls earlier next time because that would have been a, a fun ball of string to bat around for a little while. Um, <laughs> pandemic. You guys are morons and you're getting your own killed. We'll talk more about that in the next show. Take care, Johnny Million. Love you. Devin, great job. Everybody at CBT, thank you so much. Happy Pride Month, everybody. Take care of yourself and take care of somebody else. We'll see you next time.
Excellent. All right, Hal, see you next week. Also, that guy, I turned him off, put him in queue. He's like, yeah, Hal, you are out of time, and then hung up. <laughs> Tough man. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, see you guys next week. We got to get Dick K in. All right, appreciate it. Cheers. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Uh, that's adorable. Boom. See what I did there? MSDNC. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's gorgeous. Um, everybody in the chat room, uh, appreciate you guys being here. We got 398 people. Give a thumbs up. Give a like to the show. I'm sorry I can't change my look and channels and all that kind of stuff right now. The computer software is jammed up. So, uh, pandemic. Good lord. Um, but uh, so, uh, Johnny Million, I just want to uh, say the next time I'm in Chicago. We have to have like a hazmat gathering or something. We'll just, we'll, yeah, we'll, we just gotta something. have a sit down eventually. <laughs> Plandemic. Oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, you're awesome. I appreciate you being on. I'm gonna, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off no, the show uh, at this point right now and I'll come back on in a little bit because my software is hung up, like I said, and I can't properly do anything so it'll just be hung image and it won't work and i can't change the audio and all that stuff so i'm gonna sign off i will see you guys later on take care of yourself and take care of somebody else and we'll i'll i'll jump back on later on today uh and pick up a little bit of the um the other audio that i had that i wanted to play that i couldn't click through because things are frozen so anyways um <laughs> oh and, and mark says uh hal please don't change the dick k drop it's one of my favorite things ever i won't <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that has I, it to is, stay. It is, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty great. So anyways, cheers, guys. I will see you later. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the support. My mini feed isn't working either, so I can't thank everybody who gave the super chats and see what they did it. Um, I'm going to, I'll come back on at the regular time at three o'clock my time, like I normally do regular show. So if you guys want to join me again, that's awesome. Take care of yourself. We'll see you a little bit later.